here's a scholarship to USC to play basketball, and here's, you know, the New York Yankees want him to go to their class. They had a class D back then. But then when the war started, young dummies like me wanted to win the war, you see. And I wanted to get into the V-5 program, which is naval aviation. I couldn't get in because I was 17. So he goes to Wellsville at D-Ball just waiting. I played until September the 14th, came back and joined when I was 18. And that's his mindset. Forget all this other stuff. I love baseball. I'm great at basketball. I'm going to fight in World War II. Jerry flew more than 100 combat missions during World War II and the Korean War, receiving 15 medals, including the Distinguished Flying Cross. But he wasn't fond of sharing his tales of battle. And he would always say, hey, and, and keep in mind, I don't want you telling people I'm a hero, because I'm no hero. I have felt from day one, there are only one set of heroes in this country and they're all dead. Maybe the Medal of Honor people can overcome that. But basically the rest of us were just doing a job. And I would argue with him, Jerry, the only time we ever argued, Jerry, but if you didn't do your job well, others would have died and they would not have come back. So to me, that's a hero. And they don't tell stories, you have to ask them. But I did, and I just was amazed. He says, we're in Korea and we're going on a mission into North Korea, which we're not supposed to be doing, but we're going in there. And he says, it's a night flight and no moon, it's so dark. And I suddenly realized on my, on my windshield, I can't see anything. Now this is beyond dark. So Jerry says, it's, it's a single engine Corsair with a cockpit that you can open. So he says, I open, I'm wearing my radio headset, but it's radio silence for now with his wingman on either side, other Marine fighter pilots. And he opens the cockpit and leans out to see what is on the windshield because I can't see. And as he leans out, his radio headset flies off his head. It's gone. Now he knows what real radio silence is gonna be. And I said, what did you do? What was the deal? He said, well, I realized when I looked out before I closed the cockpit again, the oil had sprung a leak and it was black oil that was shooting up on my windscreen and I could see nothing. So now he's thinking, what do I do? If I peel out to go back, my wingman won't know it because I had no radio. I'm not going to hurt them. A Marine would rather die than kill a fellow Marine. So there's no way he's doing that. So he stays with it. He stays with it. He drops his bombs in, in North Korea and then he comes on back on fumes, on fumes and oil pretty much gone. He can smell it. It's burning and he gets there and he lands and he completes his mission. You know, we always called him the Colonel, you know, back in, in the early 80s, and people thought that was like an honorary designation, like, you know, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> and I would tell him, no, 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 this is not Colonel Sanders. On April the 1st, 1944, after nearly a year and eight months of long study and trying and so forth, studious that I should say, I, I became a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps and got my Navy wings of gold. And that, to this day, is the greatest achievement of my life. This is Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Coleman, retired U.S. Marine Corps, and, and you should know what he's done. I love baseball to the day I die. My time in the Marines was more important to me. And when Tom Brokaw wrote about, you know, the greatest generation, I thought, hey, I know all about the greatest generation. I knew Jerry Coleman. I was in awe. He was my dad. He was my brother. He was my friend. He was my mentor. He was the greatest human being I've ever known.